Well, it's an honor to continue in worship as we open up God's Word today. And I just want to say greetings to those on Facebook Live who are watching with us. I don't know if you, as uh, people who are here locally and stuff, would, would look, but it's amazing how far that ministry has gone. We, this last week, had over 160 people um, check out our online stuff. And uh, Linda Davis, who's Kim DeMello's aunt, actually asked us to pray for her brother, who's going to be having surgery uh, with cancer this week. And so we want to be sure to acknowledge that while you can't see them, they're with us in spirit. And so bless you as you uh, hear God speak to you wherever you find yourself today. So we're going through uh, a series, Rebuild, Restore, and Renew. And really it's a study of the book of Nehemiah, a well-known uh, particular book in the Bible among those who would seek out leadership and skills and development of how to lead people. And uh, we've been joining in with Kids Connection, which is uh, K-252, and it, it basically refers to Jesus as a teenager. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked at what Jesus was as a teenager. There's not a lot in the Bible about him, except in Luke chapter 6, verse 52, where it says, And he grew in wisdom and in stature before God and, for men, and before people. And so that's what we're saying with our kids. We want to be sure to do that. And so we're encouraging family worship. And so while the kids just left to go to their classes, know that we're going to be talking about the very same lesson in our session here that they're talking about in their classroom. And so for you as parents, this extends your conversations with your kids so that family worship is not merely a religious discipline like it happens every week but it's a meeting with the triune God in a spirit of adoration and praise. And so we've done that in music and in song and in words spoken, but now we're going to do it as we open up God's word. In fact, their theme is uh, dirty job, somebody's got to do it. And maybe you felt that this week where we're working at everything that we do with all of our heart, work as if you're working for the Lord. I invite you to open your Bibles to Nehemiah, and we're going to begin in chapter 2. Chapter 2, we're going to be looking particularly at verses 18, 19, and 20. So work your way through. If you don't have a Bible, there's one there in front of you. It's a good idea to get your phone app out. Uversion is a great app to have on your phone uh, that you can access God's Word 24-7 no matter what you're doing, where you're at. Um, so, but we see Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah is one of the, the last Old Testament historical books. Not hysterical, historical, okay? It's recording for us the history of a God who interacts with people, and particularly the people of Israel. And it records the history of this third return back to Jerusalem. They had been taken into captivity. See, God said this way. I am your God and you are my people and we are in relationship together. I've given you some guidelines to follow in your life that you may be on display as a demonstration of what life is like in relationship to a holy, living, powerful God who has a good future for you. You step out of that, you're going to suffer the consequences and that's what has happened to the people of Israel. They disobeyed God. Not only did they disobey him, they began worshiping other false gods. Not only did they do that, but they began making sacrifices to these other false gods. And so God allowed the course of consequences to happen. And they were removed from the land of milk and honey and forced into captivity in Babylon. And so for 70 years, they labored and they slaved. And that's what the whole book of Exodus is about. People crying out, God, we're sorry. Forgive us. We want to do what's right. Rescue us, right? And God goes in and provides Moses, a man who leads them into, back into relationship with him. And so here we see this, though. This is the third time where they're coming back to Jerusalem. There have been a lot of enemies that have spoken against them, that have given them a difficult time. But in Nehemiah, he didn't let that discourage him. He was a very energetic leader. As we've unpacked this, we see he has a deep trust in God. He knows him personally. He knows the characteristics of who God is. Nehemiah was a precise 
planner. He was excellent at organizing people and organizing the work. And he was discreet about it oftentimes as well. And as we open this chapter today, we see that trouble is never very far away. They don't sit around for very long doing the work of God easily. The enemy is there. And so we're going to see this as we open this word today. God's work and not ours. So today, because we're looking at such a variety of texts in 2 Nehemiah and 4th chapter and the 6th chapter, we're not going to read one specific text. So I'm going to have you stay seated this time. But in Nehemiah's appeal, if we, if we watch what he's saying, he said, I told them of the gracious hand of God upon me. Remember, God had already prepared the, the heart of King Artaxerxes so that when Nehemiah asked him for letters to give him passage and give him supplies so that he could restore the walls of Jerusalem, the King, of Artaxer- the King Artaxerxes said, yes, go, go do the work. And so he reminds the people of them, and they replied, let's start rebuilding. And so the people were already energized and excited to do that. But here's the thing. Nehemiah had enemies, enemies that were trying to discourage him and distract the people from the work that was being done. You've seen it. You've seen it in your own world, your own life where the threat of people losing control or power or influence can cause them to do some pretty naughty stuff, right? And that's what's happening here in this story today. When Nehemiah confronts, when Nehemiah confronts, we, we open now. If you've got your Bibles open to the second chapter, we see in verse 19 and 20. When Sanballat the Hornite, Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab, these three, these three characters, okay? What a trio. They mocked and ridiculed us. Have you ever been mocked? Have you ever felt ridiculed? <laughs> I have. I used to work for Ranchers Cotton Oil, and, and whenever I would do something stupid and be embarrassed about it, Everybody else would inflate it. Have you, have you experienced that? Like, like people look for you to make a mistake so they can inflate it because it makes them feel better by making you look bad. But here we see in this story, they're ridiculing them. Look what they say. What is this you're doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, watch what he says, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. And so they, these guys are coming around, they're mocking these, these enemies. They want to see what they can do to discourage them. Now, if you're in chapter 2, flip over to chapter 4. Just flip a page or scroll down. We're going to look at the first six verses because I want you to see it continues a couple chapters later, we see when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. What would cause him anger? Loss of power, loss of control, loss of influence in that region. He was incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the whole army of Samaria... He said, have you, have you ever seen that where guys will kind of speak? Look, look at what they're, look at, that, that's how I read this. Maybe you don't read it that way, okay? Maybe you just read the text. But I, I see guys like ribbing each other and pointing and ri- because they're ridiculing. So put, put some thought into what we're reading here. What are those feeble Jews doing? The, will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices. That's about their relationship with God, right? They're mocking them. They're ridiculing their relationship with God. Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life? Those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then Tobias steps in and he says, what they're building, even if a fox climbing on it would break down their walls of stones. Ah! (laughs) Come on, right? Even a fox is hilarious. Look, ridicule. They're ridiculing them. Don't just read the text. It's insulting what they're doing and what they're saying. These are the enemies of God speaking. Laughing, ridiculing. Laugh it up. 
Look what Nehemiah does. Hear us, our God, for we're being despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Nehemiah is honest with God, isn't he? Now, now, now we know Jesus said, this is not a, a pattern you want to adopt for your prayer life, okay? Get him, God. You know, like really go after him, God. Because Jesus told us we're supposed to pray for our enemies, right? And pray, pray good things upon them that they would come to know who God really is. So when we see this happening here in Nehemiah, again, he's expressing himself and he's saying, this is, this is what I, I would like to see happen, God, that you would do. This threat of attack. In the next whole chapter 4, we see throughout, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. They were trying to create confusion so that the work would stop. And I don't want to draw direct parallel to our political system today, but I am. Because isn't it true? I can't even watch the news anymore. I can't believe what is even true anymore with our politicians and our government. It's ridiculous. They're like little kids on a playground. It's embarrassing. But yet what's happening in our nation? What's happening with our leaders? What's happening to those men and women that we sent to represent us as a nation for the peace and prosperity of all? Here in this story, we see that there was a desire to create confusion because it gets you off task and you end up dealing with all the petty little stupid stuff. Nehemiah gathered these people together. And that's what we have to do as a church. We we have to recognize that we're not a, a, a nation like Israel was here. We are people in a foreign land. This is not my home. Gertie would tell you, who passed away this week, this is not my home. I'm just a sojourner here for 98 years. My home's up there, and I can't wait to get there. She's dancing with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords today. Let's look back at our text of what Nehemiah does here. Verses 14 through 16 of chapter 4. He assesses. He says, after I looked over things, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people. Now, these are the people of Israel that he's talking to. These aren't those enemies of God, those foreigners or whatever. He's now talking to the group who's doing the work, who's heard all these insults. And he's saying to them, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Do you need to hear that today? Don't be afraid of your circumstances. Don't be afraid of what may happen. Don't be afraid of all the gossip. Remember. Remember whose you are. Remember how great and awesome. And fight for your people, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your Homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of the plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work from that day on. Watch this. Half the men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. They were ready for battle. Bring it on. But we're not going to stop the work. We'll switch back and forth, right? Work hard. Pray and armed for battle. Hello, church. This is a call for us, too. Like Nehemiah, prayer is so important here at New Life Church. In fact, I got a text just the other day. I'm so thankful to be part of a fellowship that prays. Isn't that true? Let's not miss that commitment to prayer that we have no matter how busy we are. 
In both the Old Testament and the New Testament and the church today, we are in a battle. A battle. Let, don't take it for granted. In fact, Paul tells us this. We're not fighting against people made of flesh and blood. Sometimes we feel that way. Specific individuals, we're fighting and battling against them. And Paul's reminding us, no, it's not a battle of flesh and blood. There's another force out there that's at work behind the scenes. The evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against those mighty powers of darkness who rule in this world. And against wicked spirits in the heavenly realms. Listen, as your pastor here in Wendell, I've got a target on my back of the evil one. And I need your help. You, as Christian businessmen in our world today, have a target on your back. You need to maintain that authentic walk with Christ. And you need fellow believers around you to hold you up, to remind you, to help protect you, to remind you of who you are. Because one false move, one light of discovery, and it'll all fall apart. And it doesn't even need to be true. Just the accusations in your life. Can you imagine as a Christian pastor if that happened? Did you know Pastor Gary was meeting with a woman in his office and they fill in the blank? Some woman's accusing. I mean, it could happen. And where do we stand? And again, I, I don't mean to draw, I just realized, Judge Kavanaugh, okay, I, I don't mean to bring that story forward, but what I'm, I'm trying to bring to you is that as you do the things of God in your family's life, in the life of your church, let's not be naive. We are in a battle, and we need to pray, and we need to be putting forth preparation. Are we praying for our cities, our leaders, our schools? I love it that we gather together in Wendell to pray before the challenge and difficulty and action could happen. Did you know Wendell put in lock security now? You can't just walk in the door. You have to buzz in now. Maybe a lot of schools done that a long time ago. Well, we're up, we're up to speed here in Wendell. But pray for me as your pastor. Pray for your church leaders. We've experienced it. Where immoral failures happened. And I'd love to say we recognize it, confess of repentance, restoration, guiding. Those of you who know the story, there's, it's left in still brokenness. But I still believe God can work a miracle. Do we tell God the truth like Nehemiah does here? Look at verses four and five, where he says, Hear us, O God, for we're despised. We read this already. Turn the insults back on their own heads. And we're encouraged that when we're ridiculed, go to the Lord. Prioritize prayer in your life and pray honestly. And what he says is we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. We pray and we prepare. The building project is moving ahead for Nehemiah and the people. Chapter 6, the threats are no longer against the nation. Instead, they start getting directed against Nehemiah. Part of Nehemiah's greatness is the policies and initiatives that he put in place. The end of exploiting the weak in Jerusalem by those who are rich and powerful. Perhaps you remember a few weeks back. Resurging the word of God, bringing it back forward again in the letter of living by it. Chapter 5 closed with Nehemiah in prayer, asking the Lord to rule over his decisions. You know, I'm thinking about the psalmist in 127 who says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor in vain. And Nehemiah knew that very well. In chapter 6, and I invite you to open up to chapter 6 now, flip a couple more pages, we see Nehemiah face a whole bunch of distractions, and I picked a selected process of changing this slide. I want you to watch it. Nehemiah was swatting spiritual mosquitoes. Was that cute? <laughs> I had fun putting that together. Didn't want you to miss it. 
swatting spiritual mosquitoes, but let's read what's happening here. First four verses. When the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. See, the wall was a sense of security. That was a big part of why I get these walls done. And it also prevented enemies from infiltrating. And so Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. What insight. Here's these three characters. They'd already tried a few other ways of discouraging and ridiculing. Now they say, hey, come on, let's talk. Nehemiah's insight says, now they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. How do we see this spiritual mosquito of confusion or distraction, and I would say, in your life, in your ministry, in your walk with the Lord, stay focused. No matter what all is going on around you, have your priorities in place. I know it's a busy time, but don't miss your relationship with God because it infiltrates every area of your life. Make sure you're spending time in His Word. Make sure you start your day with a word of prayer. Get it right. Swat that mosquito of distraction. The glittery, shiny things that draw our attention. We're still human on this side of heaven. And we get distracted. Let's move on. Verses 5 through 10. Then the fifth time, Sambalat sent his aid to me with the same message. And in his hand was an unsealed letter. Unsealed letter, meaning open. Anybody could read it. In which was written... It's reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king. Okay, this is a, this is a lie. It's a fabricated lie right here. And have been appoint, even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There's a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So, let's meet. So now they've succumbed to, they're going to put out some lies. And not only are they saying, uh, now this report will get back to the king. You need to read in there that, and we'll make sure that it does. Right? I sent them this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. So Nehemiah recognizes the challenge here. So what what distraction or what, what spiritual mosquito are we seeing here? And I would say trusting in the truth. Trusting in the truth. And it's hard. It's hard when you're being lied about, isn't it? How tempting it would have been for Nehemiah to go line by line and offer up a detailed defense on his part. Because now they're insulting his character, what he had been in relationship with King Artaxerxes as the cupbearer. They're undermining all of that. Now listen, it doesn't always happen, but I think truth does swat away the mosquitoes of false charges. Our systems are broken. Innocent men and women do get incarcerated. It happens. For the most part, the truth gets found out and discovered. And look what Nehemiah does. Now, strengthen my hands in this situation and in this time. Let's read on verses 10 through 13 and knowing who you are. This is the thing that swats away spiritual mosquitoes as well. Is know who you are. One day I went to the house of Shema, son of Daliah, and son of Methbel. Don't you wish you were reading these words? <laughs> who was shut in at his home. And he said, let us meet in the house of God. 
Okay, that's the temple idea. Inside, inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors because some people are coming to kill you. By night, they're coming to kill you. Okay, so this guy's offering up, let's go to the temple, let's go inside of it and close the doors and hide out. But I said, should someone like me run away? In other words, who, who am I? Or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? See, only the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. There, there were restrictions. The average guy could not go into certain areas of the temple. And again, the temple is not restored. And it's, but he's saying, we should, this is where we should go. And Nehemiah is saying, I'm not the guy. I'm, that's not what I should be about. That's not what I should be doing. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because of Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. See how, see how Nehemiah sees through all of it? It sounds logically right, right? Like, it makes sense. That's what I should do. But Nehemiah says, no, this would be a sin against God to do that. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Listen, when you're out doing things and the world tells you or those around you says, everybody's doing it. Look at the financial gain you would get. Look at the opportunities you could have if you would only. Like everybody else. But yet God has fashioned you as his Christ bearer or his symbolic representation of him to do the right thing according to biblical principles. And it may cost you, but you're doing the right thing in relationship with God and relationship with other people. Now, here's the amazing thing. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Yule in 52 days. 52 days. That's almost as long as this message series has been already. <laughs> they finished the work. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized, watch this, that this work had been done with the help of our God. The people of the surrounding nations threw everything. They tried everything, and they failed. And they recognized it was because God was behind it. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. <laughs> I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But I, like you, prof profess today that I wholly lean on Jesus' name. Because see, how, it doesn't matter how important the wall was. It only provided a secure environment for what really mattered. And that was the covenant people of God living righteously as God's people. If it's true for them, it's true for us. And that's what's important for us. I encourage you as your families to be talking about this He's talking about Nehemiah 2. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. When you look around in your world, as you're, what needs restoration? What needs restoring? What needs renewal? I mean, anybody can go through life destroying people and pointing out and ridiculing and laughing. But God has called us to be builders, people of restoration. What a great example Nehemiah is to us. Let's pray. Lord, as we wrap up today's look into the book of Nehemiah, we thank you for all that encouragement it has given us. And I want to pray for churches that are gathered throughout our world today, Christian churches. Some of them are meeting and secure and hidden places because they know that if they go out publicly it could be bad news we can so freely worship here and I want to pray for families as we consider and think about 
moms and dads who are making a difference in their family and leading them to trust in you, Lord Jesus, and what prayer looks like and what going through difficulty looks like. I want to pray for the single moms out there. the weight that they carry and oftentimes feeling alone, not having that life partner to weigh things with. Thank you for good friends who walk alongside. And we can speak into each other's lives and say, look, the work is not our, just yours. It's the family of God. We make promises to you to walk alongside you, to care for you, to encourage you when it's discouraging. But bigger than that is a God who lives inside of you and walks with you. He is not planning or plotting to harm you, but give you a future and a hope. I want to pray for those marriages that are struggling today, where sometimes wife and husband just don't see eye to eye on things. Tension mounts. And before you know it, there's a fight. Sometimes in the presence of kids that see it and witness it, and they become fearful that their family's going to fall apart. God, you talk about renewal and restoration. Help us to set aside our particular preferences, desires, needs, and wants that can so easily lead us into selfishness and pride. And instead, to be the man of God, to be the woman of God that you've called us to be, to work about a healing miracle, that we can hear of marriages that have been restored because of your grace and your love, rather than busted apart because of pride and selfishness and hurt. Help us to lean on you, Lord Jesus, in every day and every moment. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.